Good morning, Afton peeps. I got the campus correct this morning, y'all. I hope and pray that will not be the only thing I get correct today. We have a lot of cool stuff to get to today in our ninth week of the New City Catechism. Um, as you get your Bibles ready, I want to give a shout out to our other campuses across town, our friends at South Green and at, and at Greenville. We are glad you are with us today. Woot, woot. New folks are like, what is he talking about? Just celebrating the fact that there are people with us to study God's word all across Greene County. So glad you're here today because we've got some interesting and really cool stuff to talk about today. This is week nine in our series called the New City Catechism. If you're new with us, the word catechism is an old-timey, fancy word um, that just means a method of teaching orally. Um, and in this case, it's a Q&A. And so our cue for today is, what does God require in the first, second, and third commandments? We talked about an overview of the Ten Commandments and the moral law of God. Uh, that was kind of a piggyback off the previous week. Um, there's something that are from God directly. They're permanent. They are meant to be lived out uh, by His people. And they continue even for us today, even if in principle form. Uh, so we're going to look at the first, second, and third commandments, and we're not going to look in Exodus 20 alone. We're going to look especially at Deuteronomy 6. We will look at Exodus 20 as well. Uh, you'll want to have Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 6, uh, perhaps Exodus 19, um, but then we'll go back and forth a couple times there and refer to a number of places. Um, when we get to the end in the New Testament, you may want to have handy Matthew 4, 2 Corinthians 3, and then Hebrews 12. At least Hebrews 12. It's too good not to read together. So Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 6, and then Matthew 4, 2 Corinthians 3, and Hebrews 12. And again, here is the question and the sermon title for today. What does God require in the first, second, and third commandments? And here's the answer according to um, the New City Catechism. Uh, let's go ahead and read this together. Here we go. First, that we know and trust God as the only true and living God. Second, that we avoid all idolatry and do not worship God improperly. Third, that we treat God's name with fear and reverence honoring also his word and works. All righty, friends, lots to get to in the text today, so grab your Bible and let's pray, and then we will dive in together. Father in heaven, we come to you today. Acknowledging first... And foremost, that our understanding of you is categorically and necessarily inaccurate. Because you are creator. You've existed before time. You made creation from nothing. And you did so by the simple power of speaking. And so we come to you today recognizing that what we do here is we ask for a miracle to happen so that you would reveal yourself to us, 
that you would, through your Spirit, animate and illuminate these words that you preserved so that even, even if they themselves are categorically unable to accurately communicate the truth of who you are as the great I am who was and is and is to come, as the Lord and King of all the universe, as the creator and sustainer, we ask that you would speak to us that you would reveal yourself to us, that you would be the teacher today so that we would leave this place changed with minds and hearts ready to worship you for who you are and not for who we want you to be, not for who we might hope that you would be, not for all the ways that we, in our brokenness, as those who, though made in your image, see through that image that is corrupt because of our sin. And so we humble ourselves and we submit ourselves to you today, asking that you would help us not to fashion you after our image, but to have hearts and minds that are properly directed at who you are so that we would worship, so that we would obey, so that we would understand that what you've done for us in the person of your son, Jesus, is incomprehensibly awesome. and that we don't deserve it, yet you offer his life for us. Communicate to us so that we would understand who we are in light of who you are. And we would lean on your righteousness for us on the cross and proclaim the gospel with power so that our worship, so that our reverence, so that our awe, so that our service, so that our use of the gifts of creation you've given to us and our gifts and our talents would be directed back to you because you deserve all the praise and all the glory on all the honor. We ask this for the sake of your goodness and glory. And all God's people said, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Exodus 20 to begin, and then Deuteronomy 6. We'll go back and forth a couple times, refer to a few places here and there. And then you'll want to have Matthew 4, 2 Corinthians 3, and Hebrews 12 at the ready toward the end. And we're going to jump right in in just a moment here to Exodus chapter 20 to just kind of get our heads around the first, second, and third commandments and then see something really cool in Deuteronomy. And again, here's today's question. The question is this, what does God require? What does God require? It's not what He asks. It's what he requires. As if to say, there's not another fitting word. Like, it's not a suggestion about the first, second, third. It's a requirement. It can't be otherwise if indeed the God of the Bible that we read about is the God who is (laughs) categorically distinct and other than us. This is why we say that he is a capital C creator and we are small c creatures. This is why we talk about him as the I am. He's outside of time. He's actually eternal. 
not limited by space and time. His power is so beyond anything we can comprehend that it's actually truer than we think to say that the God of the Bible, unless this God initiates relationship in some form or fashion, there's no hope of knowing who He is. So, so don't, don't fancy yourself with this pathetic, worldly, made-in-our-image, theology-from-below kind of small-g God as if we can tell Him what He deserves from us. That's to not understand the God of the Bible or ourselves. We start there to say, this is what He requires. And here's the answer, according to Tim Keller, who is uh, recently deceased, but he's a fancy pants um, pastor with a PhD from New York, super well-known, wrote a lot of books, and he's the one who took some of the old creeds and confessions of faith and put it into this modern language for us in the New City Catechism in this form that we have. And here's the answer, according to him, first, this is what God requires, first, and this is the first commandment, that we know and trust God as the only true and living God. Exodus 20 says it this way in verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. It's pretty simple to understand. There's no qualifications. It's just flat out, you shall have no other gods before me. So first, that we know and trust God as the only true and living God. Second, that we avoid all idolatry and that we do not worship God improperly. An idol in any form or fashion is not just a, a created thing. It's something that we give our hearts to. It's something we dedicate and commit ourselves to in a way that begins to functionally replace the place that only the God of the Bible can take. This is how it's said here in this answer. Second, what's required is that we avoid all idolatry and do not worship God improperly. There is apparently a correct way to worship God and an incorrect way. And in basic terms, the answer we'll talk about here that will become the thread for the rest of the entire message that'll sound a little bit surprising, but I think is worth us looking at. There is a proper and improper worship of God. An improper worship of God is the kind of worship that doesn't account for the things we've said about him as actually set apart, holy, H-O-L-Y, entirely, altogether, holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, other than us, because he's not contingent upon us. His existence is by itself what it is. And so a proper worship of that God has something just like the first commandment that's a principle underneath it that we're going to see here that I think is really surprising and really helpful and really cool. And the way that Exodus 20 says it is like this in verses 4 through 6, this, this idol thing. It says, you shall not make for yourself. Notice, make for yourself. Sure, we can take idols others have made and make them our own, which is functionally making it for ourselves. But it says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything <laughs> that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. I'm covering all the bases here. <laughs> No form of idolatry in any form or fashion, anywhere, wherever it comes from, however it's made. Because when we hold that thing as dear and precious and important and begin to like give our hearts to it in a way that doesn't accord with an eternally perfect God, then we're worshiping Him properly. Keep reading in 20, verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I... The Lord your God am a jealous God. This is a God who can abide no competitors. 
He tolerates no, you know, up-and-coming gods. In fact, it's conceptually, conceptually laughable, according to the Scriptures. And when he says here that he's jealous, don't make the, the silly mistake of defining that jealousy from our definitions of jealousy that are inevitably sinful, broken. When the Scriptures say that God is jealous for His glory, for His worship, the Scriptures are saying He actually deserves all of it. And he can't not get what he deserves. If indeed he is what we've just described. And to think otherwise is to do the Christian life from below. To do theology from below. As if we can define him. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. There's a proper and an improper way to worship and serve, and to love God. And the distinction is made clear. If you bow down to someone, something else, a concept, a person, a relationship, a whatever it is, then that's a form of idolatry that is improper worship. And you don't understand who God is. And this is a God who will get all glory. And then finally, in the answer it says, third, this is the third commandment, what God requires is that we treat God's name with fear and reverence, honoring also His word and His works. And that comes from Tim Keller. Fancy Pants PhD from New York City. I don't know when he wrote it. I'm just guessing 2000-ish or so. I think it was actually a little later than that. Now there's one word in that third one that we're going to focus on for the rest of our time together. And it's actually in all three of these commandments. It kind of undergirds the principle that undergirds all of them. But it's made a bit more explicit here in this statement, this answer about the third commandment, that we treat God's name with fear. Fear and reverence, honoring also his word and his works. Exodus 20, verse 7, says it like this. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't use it in empty kinds of ways, as if it doesn't have a weight and power to it. Right? So when you talk about him kind of flippantly, it's like if somebody talks about you in ways where you're like, wait, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't fit with who I am. You don't like it. <laughs> and that's you and me. A God who's actually holy, when his name is taken in vain, notice the rest of that, that verse. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain, who calls upon him, <laughs> but doesn't really. So, those three things in that answer, all of them are true. And Keller has just kind of summarized and restated these first three commandments in a way that we can pretty easily understand. And we're going to focus, when we get back to Exodus in early 2024, we're going to focus a little more on what these commandments mean in practical terms to us. We're going to unpack them with greater depth. But I want to look at something that is a principle that undergirds all three of these and I want us to help, I want us to see something in the context, not just of Exodus, but also in Deuteronomy, that is clearly there. It's there in the text. It's there over and over. Good, don't go there yet. Yeah. It's there over and over and over again. And, and as I'm studying these passages, I just I keep coming across it thinking there is something that is there that we have to see. Because if we don't see this, forget it you're not even going to get the first one, let alone the second or the third, or any of the ten. Because if you don't get this, you'll miss it all. And, and, and by all, I don't just mean the ten commandments. 
I mean, you'll miss Jesus. Because you'll not understand what he's really come to do for you. And so, to make it very easy to understand, very clear as to where we're headed, and so I don't get accused of using all these big words and being obscurantist and overly oblique, maybe even obtuse. Okay. Here's the answer. That's it. You can quote me on that. You can go ahead and write that down if you like. This is the answer. This is what God requires. What we'll see today is that the fear of the Lord, and when we mean fear, I'll never forget. It's the first week or two of Hebrew class in seminary. And uh, by the way, I had to quit and withdraw from Hebrew twice because of kids and jobs and all that stuff. So in the first of my two weeks that I did twice in Hebrew, I'll never forget the first time when the, when the teacher said, now listen, you're going to hear everybody say, well, fear doesn't like mean fear. It means like awe and reverence. As if, again, as if we can define what that is from the ground up, from us that way. And he said, uh, let me give you a, a definition of what fear is. It's fear. <laughs> and, you, and you can talk around it, you can color it with other things, you can give it other context. But I think he was telling the absolute truth about this. Because, and we'll see this in the text over and over and over again, <laughs> real actual fear of a God who can crush you for one iota of one thing that you did one time that you can't even remember. And do it justly. What do we call a God like that if it's not powerful beyond description? If it's not something we do not have a category for? This is perhaps, perhaps a little bit hard to hear at first. But the fear of the Lord in very basic terms, <laughs> meaning he actually can crush us justly for our sin, if we understand what sin is, as he's described it to us, and we understand who he is as one who cannot abide sin, who is actually holy. That kind of fear of a being like that is the necessary prerequisite for proper worship, for proper love, and proper obedience of God. Let me show you how this is the undergirding principle of the first three commandments in both Deuteronomy and Exodus. There are lots of other texts we could look to, but these are the two main ones. We've looked a bit in Exodus 23 through 7. And you may be noticing... Yes, we just read those, those three. We just read those three. The word fear wasn't there, Scott. <laughs> I know. I can likewise read. But the context surrounding Exodus 20 is replete <laughs> with fear. In fact, going back to chapter 19... If you want to look with me real quick, it says this, verse 2. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up with God. That's not really fear yet, but it's a distinction. It's a difference. It's a distinction that will have more meaning as we see here. Israel encamped before the mountain. There's a separation, distinction between Israel and Moses because Moses was called to and set apart for the purpose of being a sort of mediator with God, between God and the people. And so there's separation, holiness, and distinction here, meaning not everybody can go up and meet with God. Not everybody can go. Just one. It starts there in verse 2. Jump down to verse 5. Now, therefore, 
If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, this is what was going to be said to the people and would be said in their hearing. Therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Again, not really a whole lot of fear here, but there's a distinction. There's a set of partners. There's a difference, and this difference matters. There's a difference between what they want to do and what they can do. What God can allow them to do and how many can come up and who can talk with them and who can actually communicate. Jump down to verse 9. So the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud. They already knew this from their wilderness wanderings as the presence of God. I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. Again, distinction between Moses and the people. But there's this idea of the thick cloud. Jump down for a bit here to uh, verse 12. You shall set limits for the people all around. Take care not to go up into the mountain. Don't touch the edge of it. (laughs) It's like, don't even think about approaching it. Don't even think about it. Which is a way of visualizing the difference, not so much between Moses and God, but Moses and the people as not holy and God as holy. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. Which wasn't God just being capricious like, uh, I'm going to just set all these crazy boundaries to express, you know, a picture of how awesome I really am. So I'm just going to be like, "Uh, let's go over there. If you touch that, I zap you. Boom. He's he's communicating. (laughs) Insofar as you live and breathe and exist At all, I have power to make that happen and to take it away. And you can't approach me like you think you can. And to understand that you can't approach God like you think you can, unless God makes a way, is to understand, as we'll continue to see, that he is to be feared first. You you can't worship a God who doesn't have power, who isn't beyond you, who isn't holy, actually just, altogether right. Verse 13, no hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people, consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. There was this separation. Don't come near. You you cannot be close to me. It's sort of like God saying, this is worse than you know to be in my presence if you have sin at all. It's not a capricious God who just goes boom, zap. It's a God who's actually holy in a way that means if you come too close to that holiness, You are done. In fact, they had to consecrate themselves. They had to wash their garments. They had to make sure they didn't touch it. They had to set things apart in a way that was a picture of his set-apartness and holiness. And we're getting to fear. We're getting there. Look at this, verse 16. Again, this is before the actual giving of the law in chapter 20. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people, here we go, all the people in the camp trembled, which I don't think is Moses saying they, you know, they were just kind of like 
inappropriately fearful and scared, and they shouldn't be. Like, I mean, you can go. You can go. It's okay. Fine. No, nothing like that is in the text. There is no go ahead. It's the opposite, in fact. And when they see these kind of physical manifestations of God, they trembled. The distinction continues. Verse 17, Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. I'm not going close. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people. <laughs> warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Notice how, notice how the distinction and the fear taken with verse 21 is its own act of grace to say you don't come near stay away don't don't let them don't let them try to come to me on their own it's it's not going to work warn them lest they break through to look i'm sure they're curious i would have been man what what do you think he really looks like does it look like anything? Oh, no, dummy, he's a spirit. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, but the book of John hasn't been written yet. Okay. Notice, verse 22. Also let the priests, who function as mediators, mediators are important, Moses, priests. You don't just go on your own. Let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, set themselves apart, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come out that cannot come up to Mount Sinai. For you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said, go down, come up, bringing Aaron. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down and told them. Three, four times, lest they break through. It was with all that picture that God gives the Ten Commandments. And then in Deuteronomy, turn there if you would, please, Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is a, typically called the second law. Um, it's a copy, it's a retelling of the law. It's not a second, like a new law. It's just a retelling of the first one. And for us, though Deuteronomy tells the story of Leviticus and Numbers, especially it tells the story of Exodus, especially an extended review and additional commentary on the Ten Commandments, on the Ten Words, as they called it. And this chapter, Deuteronomy 6, was especially focused on teaching the law to the coming generations, readying the nation for its next phase of pursuing God's promised blessings. And God had freed the Israelites from slavery. He'd led them out of Egypt 40 years prior, which means there had been 40 years of wandering in the desert. And perhaps most importantly, it's been 40 years since God had given the Ten Commandments. It had been 40 years since Exodus 20 here in Deuteronomy 6, and Moses is about 120 years old-ish. He's going to be moving on. It's the end of his life. It's time to move forward into the promised land. And so he tells the story again. He talks again to the people saying, let me tell you what it was like. Let me tell you how important this is. I'm, I'm going to reiterate. I'm going to retell again so that you know moving forward. And one of the things that he focuses on here in Deuteronomy, in fact, it's a theme of the entire book of Deuteronomy. There are a number of themes, but this is one of the main ones. Fear is the prerequisite for understanding who God is so that we can ably worship. 
so that we can obey because his law actually comes from his character and nature. It's not just theoretical ideas. And in fact, unless we understand a proper fear of his holiness and his power in distinction from our unrighteousness and our helplessness in our sin. Without understanding that, you you won't worship him. You won't serve him. In fact, you won't understand the love of a God who is categorically other and actually holy and doesn't, doesn't have any reason other than his own good pleasure and loving kindness to accommodate us and cover our sin. Zero reason. Unless you understand that proper fear of God, you won't worship Him, you won't serve Him, you won't love Him, you won't obey Him from the place that understands who He really is. So, they're listening to Moses preach, and they weren't there in Exodus, but He's telling them, You have to fear the Lord. You have to fear the Lord. You have to fear the Lord. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is preceded by a number of interesting places that talk about fear. And let me just mention one. The people had been been told to go into the promised land. And in chapter 1, they're supposed to go up, they're supposed to take possession of the land, just as the Lord said. And Moses says, don't be fearful. Don't be dismayed. Be of good courage. Do not fear. That fear, he says that, is not a fear of the Lord. What they feared about going to the promised land had nothing to do with the fear of the Lord. It had to do with the fear of those who were in the promised land that they were scared of and worried about. This was not a fear of God. This was a fear of man. And then notice in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7, Moses tells more of the story after their fear, and he says, listen, y'all, the Lord has blessed us, has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years, God has been with you, and you have lacked nothing. What should you fear from man? In effect, he says, and then he says, Deuteronomy 6, 13 and 14 summarizing the first three commandments. They say this. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Don't fear man. Don't fear the Malachites. Forget about the Canaanites. They're they're not that big a deal, frankly. (laughs) Your boss, your employer, your friend, the people horizontally that you fear. You know, the ones that Jesus was not talking about when he said in Matthew 10, Don't fear them. Fear fear the one who can kill the body. Fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear God. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but not the soul. In effect, Moses has said the same thing at the beginning of Deuteronomy. And he says here, the same kind of thing that Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 13, Deuteronomy 6. It's the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by His name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. All three of the commandments are here with the added idea of fear. And then notice verse 15 in Deuteronomy 6. Don't go after other gods. Don't bow to them. Don't make idols of them. Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Why? Verse 15, for the Lord your God is in your midst, and He is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and He destroy you from off the face of the earth. Don't put God to the test, He says. Don't put Him to the test. There's a connection between these three commandments about worship and love of God. 
and bowing down to God only and serving Him with an understanding of this undergirding principle of His first to be feared in a way that means we understand at a fundamental level as best we can that God's holiness, power, eternal character, and nature as capital C Creator means He is actually unknowable by us unless He finds a way. I know your mom and grandfather and uncle twice, twice removed, they were all wonderful, lovely Christian people who taught you the gospel, who said, you can just come as you are. You just, just come as you are. So far, <laughs> the Old Testament makes clear that you don't just come as you are. The flippancy that defines God after you and your expectations and your demands and your desires is the kind of flippancy that will not worship God as he is, but as you want him to be. And that's a God who can't save you. That's a God who will functionally condemn you even as you give your heart to him. Which, by the way, is another form of idolatry, of self. And I'm putting a fine point on fear because fear is worship of God as holy creator who is actually unable to be known and understood and loved unless he somehow initiates the revelation of himself. It isn't just mere reverence or awe that stands at the precipice of the Grand Canyon and goes, so awesome. That's true. But it's still not categorically the same as who God is in comparison to the Grand Canyon and your perceptions of how cool the Grand Canyon is. The result of a worshipful fear of God is humility. Humility is a prerequisite for coming to understand that you need what he has and you don't have it. And you don't have the power. Fear was a necessary factor in Israel's proper worship of God, obedience to his law, and awareness even of their own failure to righteously obey it. In fact, throughout the entirety of Exodus 19 and 20, fear of God is the principal undergirding what has to be there in order to rightly see and worship him as he is. Fear of God is the humility that undergirds Proverbs 1, 7 and a whole bunch of places in the Psalms and Proverbs that say fear is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's not a part of it. It's not a factor in it. It's not a big, important piece of it. It's the beginning of it. Look up all those passages that talk about fear as the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Fear of God is a necessary prerequisite of understanding the kind of humility that depends on his character and nature to save through a righteousness that is a mediator that you have to have that you can't make. You can't fashion him as an idol. You can't make yourself into it. You can't do anything to earn it or deserve it. Fear of God is a necessary, humble prerequisite for understanding our sin and his sinlessness. It was a necessary prerequisite for Adam and Eve in the garden. <laughs> they make fig leaves to hide themselves from what? God's ruach in the cool of the day. That's the, that's the word for ruach, spirit. It's the God coming in the spirit that they knew was judging them because they were sinful before him. And when he came into their presence, they hid themselves. Genesis 2, 7, and 8, you can look it up yourself. 
Fear of God is the humility and knowledge of God. That's the prerequisite creatureliness of understanding who we are that has to be there if there is to be proper worship, service, obedience, and even, ultimately, love of God. Three application points, two of which are quickish. First is this, we must recall our Exodus stories and teach these commandments. We didn't have a lot of time to talk about Deuteronomy 6, but one of the most important things about Deuteronomy 6, as you may can, maybe can understand from the context we talked about, <laughs> is that this new generation hadn't been there to witness and experience and be a part of the miracle of God leading them out of slavery, out of Egypt. They weren't there when the law was given. They didn't hear the thunders and didn't hear God's voice as He gave the law. And one of, one of Moses' main things here is we must recall our own Exodus stories. We must teach these commandments to ourselves, recall these stories to ourselves, and to future generations and to those around us. Why? In order to maintain a proper fear of God, that's the prerequisite for humbly worshiping and serving Him alone. If you communicate the gospel as if it's good news that doesn't have to be preceded by the bad news of our sin that is distinct and not a part of God's character and nature. If we, if we are communicating an Exodus story like that, then we are we're talking about asking people to give themselves to something. That's going to lack the kind of humility required for a life of worship, a life of serving, a life of understanding that when you give yourself to this God, He actually deserves it. And we have, we have to recall for ourselves what that was like. We have to preach that story to ourselves and to others. I remember as a freshman and sophomore in college, I came back home a couple times and I thought, you know, mom and dad, I don't really know hardly anything about the inside track of your stories of coming to faith. <laughs> Could you tell me those things? Oh, yeah, sure. I learned a lot. It was so helpful. If you have Exodus stories, tell these. Tell the story. Tell it to yourself. Write it down. Apply the biblical narrative to your life so it will write your story. Let the Scriptures interpret you and be the filter that directs your understanding. Second is this. Many of us are still loving and obeying God on fumes from a vague and long since distant exodus miracle of God's Spirit to speak to our hearts. At a time when we knew we were powerless over our sin and desperately in need of the blood of Christ. Perhaps, friends, it's time to get back to your first love, to go back to basics, to recall that it's only because God is loving and merciful and kind that He does anything other than justly crush every human under the thumb of His wrath against sin, the sin that we love, that He cannot abide. Perhaps for some of us, it's time to commit it's time to commit ourselves to something significant such that it requires God to do work. Some of us need to set our faces to Jerusalem and die to self for the sake of those in the city who have no fear of God in their eyes and who are dead in their trespasses and sins. You see, 
If you understood the creator God who is holy and eternal and who made you and who has in his pinky more than enough power to sustain the very existence of every single molecular anything throughout the entire universe at every single moment throughout all of history without even thinking or trying or so much as formalizing it, but simply by existing. This is a God who sustains us by existing. If you understand that, then you understand that he is to be feared and worshipped and praised and honored as such. If you understand him for who he is, then you will gladly abandon those kind of pathetic and empty comforts of a life of easy. So many of us are in pursuit of pathetic and empty, easy idols of comfort. And they keep us from seeing the God who gave everything for us in Jesus. Do you want to see who God really is? <laughs> then we need, to, we need to have a vision for our lives that risks ourselves for the sake of the gospel so that it requires the kind of dependency of exodus power that looks in the face of the world's evils and tyrants and proclaims good news to them. You won't do that you won't do that if you do not know who God really is. You want to rediscover your fear of God and to rekindle a love for Him? <laughs> do something that requires His power and not your own. I don't know about you, I'm just sick and tired of weak and effective, powerless, complacent, self-proclaimed Christians living a life that requires no spirit in their hearts. No, no truth of who God is. No humility. No sacrifice. If you want to love Jesus Christ, follow Him to a cross on which you die daily. And stop making him after your own image and expectations. If he actually lived a perfect sinless life for us and he died in a way that is actually effective because of that perfect sinless life, it shows a sacrifice worth our whole lives. I'm just... I'm just not feeling a dependency upon God. It's like I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not wanting to obey Him. That's because you're hardly in the game. Do something that requires the power of God. Because, friends, it was exactly that kind of awareness of His power and our powerlessness and our utter dependency upon him. It was exactly that kind of awareness that motivated your love for God in the first place. And we are painfully over time, but first, before we end, let's talk gospel in Jesus. Application point three. The beauty and wonder of the good news is that a proper fear of a holy God is the context from which we learn to love and worship Christ as Lord and obey God from gratitude for a perfect Savior, for a perfect Savior who died for our sins. Look at Hebrews 12. What a cool passage. The writer of Hebrews points directly to Jesus by contrasting him with the scenes we just looked at in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 6, contrasted Jesus, 
specifically with this scene in Exodus, because he's a reason to be able to approach God with a kind of confidence and righteousness that casts out fear. Not of God with Jesus, but of God without Jesus. Hebrews 12 says this, start at verse 18. Unlike Exodus, unlike Mount Sinai, unlike Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 6, you have not come to what may be touched. It's a curious phrase. It's a weird way to start. So this side of the cross, because of Jesus, because of his righteousness, we've not come to what may be touched. You can't even, you can't even touch this because it's a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and whose voice and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, calling back to Exodus. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches that one, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion. You couldn't get there before. Now you can. According to the writer of Hebrews, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven, and to God, you have come to, verse 22, but you have come to, dot, 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 middle of verse 23, to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to Jesus, who is the mediator of a new covenant. A new way of operating with God the Father. You've come to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It speaks a better word because unlike the blood of Abel, which cried for vengeance, the blood of Jesus says forgiveness. Sins covered. Take my righteousness. Know God the Father and have eternal perfect relationship with Him because my life lives for you, whereby, Jesus speaking, I perfectly fulfilled all three and ten and six, thirteen, and all the other commands that could possibly be lived up to or not. I perfectly lived according to that in a way that means you are justified and made right with God in ways that you could not without me. Let's simply ask this question and quickly pray in about negative 10 minutes. Are you properly in fear of the Lord so that your worship, obedience, and love are motivated by humble submission to Him? Simple question. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we recognize because you've given us your spirit and offered us your righteous life, we recognize that we Pervert our understanding of you because we expect and want something different. Help us to reckon with the truth. That you cannot abide any sin. And help us to revel in the good news. that reclaims the truth, that preaches the truth to ourselves day in and day out, that retells the story of what you've done for us such that we can know that the fact that you are actually holy and perfect and beyond our greatest thoughts and descriptions of you is no longer a reason for our failure that condemns. You've made a way for us 
you've given us the blood of your son Jesus that cries out forgiveness. Thank you for that amazing truth, Lord, for making a way for us, for initiating so that we could know you and be in your presence forever. We love you because of that. We live our lives in gratitude because of that. We spend ourselves for the sake of communicating your goodness and glory so that we would experience the joy of your goodness made known. We pray this in the name of Jesus.